what an incredible gift. Hallelujah. You have a Pentecostal woman. <laughs> Hallelujah. My dungeon shook. And my chains fell. What a blessing to be here today. I certainly honor the presence of the living God that is in this chapel. My brothers and sisters, thank you for the invitation to my dear, dear friend and colleague, Dr. Tracy West. And to our visitors who are with us today, the Reverends Vanessa Brown and Tawana Gauls, who pastor two churches in New York, Rivers of Living Waters, and Family of Faith. And they are with us today. And of course, my partner and spouse and prayer partner and friend and all of that of 26 and a half years. I'm so blessed to have her with me. She's traveling with me now, so that's making traveling really easy. <laughs> and I'm so blessed to have Shirley with me. You hear that voice that sings on Happy Day for 40 years, yes. from Hawkins family years ago. That's the Shirley Miller, who I get to hear often. So I'm grateful to God for her being here. Earthquakes. I'm from San Francisco, sisters and brothers. <laughs> I come from a place where earthquakes are way of life. And we are conscious of them. And we build our buildings with earthquakes in mind. Because we know what happens when you don't. Our history tells us that no matter how fabulous, how magnificent, we build our architecturally renowned structures and monuments because they are dead when we build them and they're on a living earth they can be utterly destroyed in a matter of seconds even our monuments have to respect our movement we do that again even our monuments have to respect our movement or they risk being destroyed our monuments have to be what we call in San Francisco, retrofitted. Yes. Retrofitted. Let me tell you a little something about retrofitting. <laughs> when we bought our building down south of Market in San Francisco, and we decided that we wanted to upgrade our building's annex to be a youth center for our neighborhood, we got all of our plans lined up and all of our design work out of the way, what they call soft costs, began with a budget of about $800,000, ended up spending about a million four because of something called retrofit. What happened was when our engineers dug deep underneath our building, they found out we had an aquifer. Aquifer. It means that at some point in time, water ran under that building, and if you dug deep enough, you'd hit it. And it would come up, and so we had to dig out our foundation, put in a concrete basin, put in what's called rebar, the long metal strips of stuff, you know, pour concrete, wait for it to dry and settle, pour some more, Wait for it to dry and settle before we could complete the work that we were doing in our youth center. Retrofitting. Then we had to clamp the metal sides of our second story, metal second story, to the sides of our building. Then we had to clamp the building's roof to the sides of the building, and we had to have fabricated steel for all of that. Retrofitting. Yes. Double the <laughs> cost to build our center. Retrofitting is incredibly expensive, but retrofitting is necessary in earthquake zones. Why? Because retrofitting essentially mimics living things. The idea of retrofitting is in the event of an earthquake, which, by the way, either moves like this or like this. The idea is that the building will mimic 
what living things do. Essentially, the building will sway and move with the sway and move of the living earth. If the building doesn't flex, sisters and brothers, it's coming down. And under some of our great big, big structures, there's built an interesting device. They couldn't move the building, so they went underneath them and they put some stuff that bounces. So when the building shakes or moves, they're hydraulics. And instead of the building breaking, it bounces up and down, or it rolls back and forth. But the idea is that it mimics a living thing. All right, all right. And even when some of them fall, because the earth is a living thing. It's not because we didn't try to make our buildings mimic the movement of the earth. Here's the truth, sisters and brothers. It's time for us to know the difference between a monument and a movement. Church history is filled with monuments. Big, formidable, Miserable institutions <laughs> that over time become immovable and entrenched with ideologies that divide and separate and diminish and destroy in the name of an angry, pissed off, and punitive God. <laughs> and God gets more angry as God gets older in these institutions. <laughs> more grumpy, more grumpy, less willing to change, unwieldy, intractable, something happens to God as God ages in our institutions. And when that begins to happen in our faith-based religious institutions and denominations, thank God that God sends a shaking. Shaking. All right. Some people call it reformation. Shaking. Yeah. A rethinking, a retooling, an opportunity to look again at what really needs to continue to stand and what needs a good shaking to make it fall down, yes. to make room for something else to be built oh, in its place. Yeah. Thank God for shaking. And people who are invested <laughs> In the institution and the angry God of the institution don't like shakings. Nope. Nope. Don't like movement. Yeah. Get real angry with movement. Yeah. See, when movement comes, it brings an end to many monuments that simply will not die on their own. Yeah. All right. <laughs> they just won't do it. And what needs to change? Mm -hmm. That's hard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Some folks thought that a big, fine institution with some exclusionary clauses and its religious rules would be strong enough to hold back a movement. Mm -hmm. No matter how big and how finely built, when a real shaking comes along, a love shaking, mm -hmm. a unity shaking, mm -hmm. a justice shaking, yeah. It will bring miserable monuments down every time. Mm -hmm. Because monuments are not built with the movement in mind. And when monuments are built, the idea is that they will always stand. The idea is that they will never change. The idea is that they are strong enough to withstand any. But you know, that's what they thought when they buried Jesus. All right. All right. Put him in there, put a stone in front of him, that rattle rousing, trouble making, insolent, anti religious fellow. Put him in there and put a stone over the front of it. Take off your bearing gloves, throw the flowers, go home, and we're finished and we're done. But what they did not anticipate is resurrection power. Yeah. Right. Resurrection power, by definition, is what brings life out of death. The decomposed being recomposed. 
bringing life out of death. What they didn't anticipate is the shaking. Because monuments are not built with movement in mind. You see, it was movement that freed the slaves. It was a movement that got women to vote. It is movement that brings justice to workers. It is movement that brings equality to marriage. It is movement that frees the same gender community. It is movement, it is movement, and, and sometimes you get in trouble when you're into movement. You can get on the list when you're into movement. Sometimes folks don't give you the cushy churches in the suburbs when you're into movement. You can, you can, you can get a reputation when you're into movement, but every great change that has ever been experienced in time has come from a group of determined, focused people yes. who know that it is time for us to move against the monuments that stand in the way of the justice of Jesus Christ. Yes. God is about movement. Yes. I said God is about movement. Yes. My brother said that our dungeons shake and our chains fall off. Mm -hmm. And then I remember a story about the end of slavery in England and and, and somebody said, why did slavery end so quickly in England and go on so long in the Americas? Well, first of all, a lot of African slaves in England decided real quickly in the institution, in that insidious institution, that they weren't going to be slaves. And they said, and it started with them, before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go on to my God and be free. And they had something that they did, and some of you have read the book, they buried their chains. What they did is they found the chains that bound them and they had a little ceremony and they dug a hole in the ground. And they put their chains in the ground and they tapped down on that. And they said that mantra, before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. You see, it's something about it when shaking really happens and movement begins that the people who were once bound are the ones who decide that they will take their freedom back and go through the things that they have to go through to make an outward demonstration of their inward reality. And so it is in our Bible lesson. Before I sit down, I want to say something to you about what happened in that jail. When the earthquake did come, and freedom did happen, in order for freedom to be realized, there had to be some movement. God did God's part. And then those who were once in prison had to get up and get out of there and do their part. Because God is about movement. Living water. Water doesn't freeze when it's movement. We do that again. Water doesn't freeze when it's moving. Monuments fall, and they fall before movements every time. Why? Because God is not a stagnant, privately owned pond, but a fresh flowing river filled with fresh liberating truth and extravagant welcome. It's not God that's stuck. It's us that's stuck. The atmosphere is demanding equality and justice. And there is a call for a movement. And so, I'm deputizing you today. Yes. All right. All right. That the spirit of apathy will come off of us and the spirit of yes. movement yes. will come into us and that we'll be baptized and become the kind of troublemakers <laughs> that Jesus was and is. This is why this movement is not gender limited or denominationally limited or class limited or orientation limited or institutionally limited because a movement can break out anywhere. Yeah. And when it does, all prison bars have to surrender their hold on the minds and the freedoms of those held in bondage. The earthquake came about midnight. Oh, I have to be real careful right here. The earthquake came about midnight, just 
at the time at which a day was ending and a new day was beginning. Amen. I want you to know there is a day that is ending. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And there's a page turning and there's a brand new beginning. Uh -huh. And it's right in our hands. And we are the people of the turning page. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We are the ones that are moving from what was to what is to come. And when the shaking ended, what remained was what mattered. Sisters and brothers, when the shaking is over, All right. what will be left is what matters. We are the movers and shakers, and you're in this room. You are the prophetic now. We are in this room right now, prophets of this present age. We're shaking, and we are being shaken. I know what is happening to you in your night dreams and your day visions driving along in your car mm -hmm. and the Spirit of God descends yes. and begins to speak into you what your future is going to be. We are the shakers who are being shaken in this movement of freedom and justice for all. It's earthquake time. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah.